Thank you. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to uh, give some remarks today. Uh, I'll be uh, providing two talks. The first talk is going to be more about the ethics of alignment, and then the second talk is going to be more about um, kind of the, the social side of AI alignment. Um, I understand that the overall series that uh, is being presented here is a bit more on the kind of mathematics, computer science side. So I'll try to provide a complementary perspective to that. Let me go ahead and try to pull up my slides. I'm going to have the slides there, and let me just hang out here on the edge of the screen so that, that you guys can see me while I, I speak. So again, my name is Seth Baum. I am executive director of the Global Catastrophic Risk Institute. We are a nonprofit and nonpartisan think tank that uh, works across the full range of global catastrophic risks. That includes uh, climate change, nuclear weapons, pandemics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of our work over the years has been on artificial intelligence. The specific AI scenarios that we have mainly focused on are scenarios involving uh, very advanced future AI systems that could potentially you know, take over the world and kill everyone, essentially, which suffice to say would constitute a pretty significant um, global catastrophe. And my uh, remarks today are largely motivated by that type of scenario, although a lot of what I have to say is also applicable to uh, more near-term scenarios in which the, the AI is you know, not that powerful. Um, a lot of this is fundamental principles about um, how to design AI systems that is applicable to pretty much any type of, of AI system, though some of it may make more sense when we're talking about the possibility of the, the very advanced future AI systems. So uh, with that in mind, let me go ahead and get started with my slides. The uh, main idea of this first talk is that there is a sense in which the AI alignment problem is wrong, or maybe that's a bit too strong. We might say instead that it's not quite right. And by that, I mean that this idea that we have about the AI alignment problem, and especially the AI alignment problem as being something that is essential to addressing, um, you know, to, to developing AI systems, it, the standard idea of AI alignment, it's missing some things that we need to fill in in order to have a more nuanced understanding of AI alignment and how we understand that then affects everything else that we do for AI systems, including uh, what you know, what algorithms we try to develop, what computer code we write, how we how we build these systems. So this is fundamental questions about um, what type of systems, uh, AI systems, we should be building. So big picture, uh, what we're motivated by here today is the question of um, how do you build a good AI system? And this to me is like, this is the fundamental question for AI. Like, how, how do you do this? How do you build a good AI system? And that can then be broken into uh, three sub-questions. The first is a conception of what it means for an AI system to be good in the first place. Second, the, the algorithms and, and computer code that you need to implement this conception of good into an AI system. And then third, you need some sort of implementation of that. You need to actually build the thing because you could have a good idea, you could have the algorithm in place, but unless you've actually built that into an AI system, then you know, it's kind of all for nothing. And so this talk that I'm giving right now is on that first part, the what does it mean for an AI system to be good in the first place? So let's, uh, I'm gonna start with some general concepts that will help us think about what it means for an AI system to be good. Uh, the first is the distinction between a subject and an object. Now, these terms can be used in a variety of different ways, but for our purposes today, we will use uh, the word subject to mean the thing that does the thinking, 
and then the object as being the thing that is being thought about. And you know, this should be familiar. Like we might think of certain certain research or certain certain claims as being more subjective versus being more objective. Like a subjective idea is something that's mostly rooted in somebody's opinion or you know, it's very much dependent on what's going on in their mind. Something that's more objective is more rooted in the world itself, such that anybody, regardless of what's going on in their mind, is probably going to agree with it. Like the reality of gravity, for example, would seem to be fairly objective versus like my opinion of, of the best, you know, which which food tastes the best. That's a relatively subjective thing. And so uh to give a few examples, like uh, a person or, or, or somebody looking at a mountain could, the, the subjective part would be in their mind, they're going, wow, a mountain, and the objective part would be the mountain itself. The, the object is, is the mountain, the subject is the one that really, literally the mind that's thinking about the mountain. Okay, and then it could be uh, like a mind thinking about itself. So if you were a porcupine, for example, then you thinking about yourself, uh, you as a porcupine could be both the subject and the object at the same time because you're thinking about yourself. And the object can also be something more abstract, like happiness. Um, and so the the idea of happiness, happiness now is the object because like me as a, a subject, I'm thinking about happiness, happiness is the object. Now, there are some limits to this. If you are familiar with the philosophy thought experiment of the, the brain in a vat, this is the idea that if you are looking at a mountain, are you sure that you're actually seeing a mountain? Or alternatively, perhaps, your brain could be sitting in some vat of fluids connected to a computer somewhere, and that computer is feeding your brain with the sensory information that makes it look like you are seeing a mountain, but there is no mountain. You're just thinking there's a mountain because there's that sensory input. It's like the, the Matrix world in the movie The Matrix. Now, the point of this is just to really help us appreciate the nature of our, our subject exp subjective experience and to help us um, you know, kind of get a deep sense for the nature of subjects and objects. We don't actually need to get into that for, for purposes today. We're just going to assume that the mountain exists. Okay, so what does that have to do with ethics? There are uh, two types of ethics. Okay, ethical theories can be divided in a variety of different ways, but one major way of dividing them is between subjective and objective ethics. So now the subject is the same thing. It's the the we're now talking about moral subjects. So this is someone who, or some, some essentially some mind that is able to think about ethics. So us as human beings, our minds are capable of thinking about what's, you know, what's ethical, what's good and bad and right and wrong and so on. Uh, perhaps other species are also able to do the same. And then the object is whatever it is that, that we think is good. So. Uh, for example, uh, we might say happiness is good. And so this is us as moral subjects thinking that happiness is good. And then there's also a sense in which we could think of happiness as being just good. Now, I want to pause a little bit to really explain this distinction because it's a little bit subtle. The question here is, is happiness good? because people or, or moral subjects more generally think that happiness is good, that we believe it is good? Or is there a sense in which happiness is just good regardless of what anybody thinks about happiness? Like, is, is happiness inherently good on its own regardless of what people think about it or regardless of what anyone thinks about it? Or does the goodness of happiness derive from the fact that there are people out there that are there are moral subjects out there who consider happiness to be good. That's the distinction. Where does the ultimate goodness come from? Does it come from the object itself 
or does it come from moral subjects and their ideas about the, the value of those objects? That's the essential distinction between subjective and objective ethics. Subjective ethics places uh, the, the origin of good within the moral subjects, what is good is defined in terms of what moral subjects consider to be good, versus objective ethics says that uh, certain objects will be good regardless of what moral subjects think about it. That's the, the essential distinction. And for something like happiness, it might not matter that much because you know we might uh, say like, objectively happiness is a good thing, but indeed lots of people and presumably any other moral subjects would agree that happiness is good. So there's not much, uh, not much of a distinction. For other things, the distinction can be more salient. So for example, suppose there was someone out there who just deeply believes that lemon cookies are morally good. This is not something that we would typically say like objectively uh, moral uh, lemon cookies are, are a morally good thing. Um, I mean, okay, sure, somebody likes them, fine, but it's, it's kind of a curious thing to consider to be uh, just fundamentally morally good, except for some, some people might happen to value them. To take a more extreme example, suppose there are some, some individuals out there who believe that torturing the innocent is, is morally good. Uh, that's something that most of us would would agree no those those whoever might think that they're wrong that torturing the innocent is not morally good despite what what some some misguided people or or, or whatever might might think about it uh, so another example is on the natural environment we could imagine a world in which there are no moral subjects but the natural environment's still there maybe you know plants and, and trees and, and forests and rivers and so on, that all still exists. So the question is, and this is one of the fundamental questions in uh, environmental ethics, in such a world where there was nobody to value and appreciate nature, would the nature still have value? Or does all of the value of nature come from moral subjects, be them humans or, or anything else, uh, valuing the natural environment. And so a, a thought experiment, and so imagine a, two different worlds with no, um, with no moral subjects. You could have on one hand, um, a world with, you know, lush ecosystems and so on, just nothing that is, has the, the cognitive capacity to think about ethics. And then second, a world of just complete nothingness, that nothing exists. And, and we might consider which of those worlds is better. And it's easy to reach the conclusion that the world that has the, the last ecosystems and so on is better, even though there are no uh, moral subjects out there to recognize it as being better. That's uh, kind of a good test example for, for understanding um, the distinction between objective ethics and, and subjective ethics. Okay, so what does this have to do with AI? Uh, it is especially relevant for um, machine ethics, which is uh, one of the two major branches of AI ethics, it's essentially the ethics of uh, what we build into the AI system. So AI systems, will then will be designed in a certain way and they will go out and do things. It's the ethics of what they will go do and how you design the AI systems to go behave in ethical ways. The other side of AI ethics is on governance, which is the ethics of, of how we go about developing and, and using AI systems. Uh, so that's not the ethics that's built into it. That's the ethics that guides human behavior uh, as it relates to AI. And the second talk will be more on the, the governance side. Okay, so with those preliminaries in mind, we can now start to talk about the AI alignment problem. And in most general terms, what do we mean by the AI alignment terms? I think in most general terms, we can call the AI alignment problem as being the problem of aligning AI system behavior with some sort of ethical theory. 
Uh, now, that word sum is doing a lot of work here. Some ethical theory. Okay, fine. Which ethical theory? And this is where the, the preliminaries start to come into play because we could already start to think of AI as being aligned with, say, either human values or human interests. So human values would be um, the AI should do what humans want it to do. And then uh, human interest would be the AI will do uh, whatever it is that is good for humans. And those are not necessarily the same thing. So for example, there are humans out there who will uh, think that the natural environment is a good thing. It's a fairly common uh, moral perspective for humans to take. Uh, but the natural environment is not necessarily good for humans. Often it is. Obviously, humans can't live without a natural environment. We would, you know, we wouldn't have air to breathe and and so on and so forth. But there are aspects of the natural environment that people do value, even though it is not necessarily good for humans. And probably the clearest example of this is the protection of biodiversity. Certainly some biodiversity is valuable for humans. It's, it's in human interests to protect the biodiversity, but there is also a lot of biodiversity that humans care about. We go out of our way to protect that, for better or worse, we don't really need uh, if that species goes extinct or so, like we'll still be okay. We protect that biodiversity because we just, we care about it, we value it. And so, if you have AI that's aligned with human values, that could include that extra biodiversity protection. Whereas if it is in human interests, then you're still going to have some biodiversity protection, some environmental protection, but maybe not as much, uh, and maybe different aspects of, of environmental protection than if the AI was aligned with, with human values. And so what we decide to align AI with is going to have a lot of, um, it's going to affect the outcomes of what the AI system then would go out and do in the world. For example, is it going to, uh, you know, what, how is it going to behave with respect to biodiversity and environmental protection? Now, oops, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. There we go. Okay. So, um, the, uh, where are we? Uh, there we go. Okay. So the uh, two main concepts, or, or at least two of the, the main concepts for how we should be designing AI systems, one being uh, value alignment and the other being AI safety. These actually fall on opposite sides of this subjective objective uh, uh, spectrum in that value alignment, this is aligning with values. This is uh, uh, humans as the, the moral subjects, and we are aligning with whatever values they have. Then safety, this is about interest. So it's in human interests to not be harmed uh, and certainly killed by the, the AI systems. And so we want to design AI systems that are in um, this aspect of human interests. And sure, we might all agree that the uh, that it would be bad for for us to be harmed, uh, except maybe in certain special cases in which uh, the AI actually should harm some people because they're doing something wrong, or, or it's uh, there. There can always be exceptions, but these do fall on opposite sides. Like value alignment is fundamentally about subjective ethics, whereas safety is fundamentally about objective ethics. And so these require uh, very different approaches to uh, designing the AI system, whereas value alignment, you have to design an AI system to figure out what it is that humans value. With safety, you're making the upfront judgment that safety, human safety is a good thing. And so you just design the system to do that without considering any other detail about human values. When we talk about quote unquote, the alignment problem, we are generally talking about aligning AI with human values. Uh, this is in the title of, of this book, for example, about um, AI alignment. But 
the alignment problem. And we really should have the word the in, in scare quotes here because you know that's not quite right. It's not the alignment problem. It is an alignment problem, the, the problem of aligning AI with human values. And it's really more accurate uh, and really clear to speak in terms of the alignment problems, plural, because there are there is more than one alignment problem. So for example, the problem of uh, aligning AI with human values is a, a subjective ethical concept for alignment. The problem of aligning AI with safety is that's a, an objective conception of AI alignment. And the subjective objective distinction is one main way to distinguish different types of AI alignment, but really it fits into a uh, two by three matrix of uh, different forms of AI alignment or, or different uh, issues that are raised by AI alignment. The first one is the question on, so moving down uh, vertically, so there's the subject object distinction, but then uh, of the, the three going down. The first one is the question of which subjects and which objects. This idea that we saw before of aligning AI with either human values or human interests, the, the humanness of it is, you know, that was a, that is a decision that would need to be made. You could alternatively phrase it just in terms of aligning AI with the values and interests of either moral subjects or moral objects. And those subjects or objects could include people, but they could also include you know, porcupines and other animals, could conceivably even include the AI itself, uh, especially if we're talking about more advanced AI that it has the capacity to um, you know, hold moral values not just in the sense that there's some values that are coded into it, uh, but in the sense that it is a moral subject that's able to think and reason and, and understand morality, similar to how humans and, and presumably at least some other animals are able to, to understand morality. And you know, this raises questions of, okay, so which AI systems would potentially be able to do that? That same type of question applies to the non-human animals, we're not exactly sure which um, which non-human animals are capable of understanding and, and engaging in moral reasoning. Uh, there is a little bit of research on this. It's not an easy question to answer, but this is the type of question that gets raised. And then also, we can think of the interests of some things that would not classify as moral subjects. So the interests of a, a tree or, or an ecosystem. You know, it's it is coherent to think of a tree as having interests, even though it doesn't have that that subjectivity, or at least we're generally under the impression that, that a tree would not be a moral subject. And then uh, in addition to all that, all of this applies to both current subjects, but also future uh, subjects and, and objects, in that should an AI system be designed to account for the values of future moral subjects or the interests of future moral objects. Uh, arguably, it should, because if the AI system is itself affecting future uh, objects and, and, and subjects, then arguably they should be included in how um, the, the AI system decides what to do. Uh, this, of course, raises deep questions about so how do you figure out what the values and interests of, of future subjects and objects are? It's not an easy question to, to answer. You know, presumably, the, the AI is not going to have time travel at its disposal or anything like that. Um, and so the challenge then becomes how do we conceive of, of algorithms and computer code that could accommodate uh, whatever value we might consider future subjects and, and objects to have. Okay, so that's the first one about uh, which subjects and, and which objects to align the AI system to. Uh, second one is on how to measure their values or their interests. And this is not a a straightforward one. So for example, within human society, 
a common thing to do is to ask people questions about what it is they value, such as in, in voting. Um, and so voting essentially, you know, they ask you, do you want this person to win the election or that person to win the election? Sometimes when you vote, there's a policy question. Do you want this policy to be enacted? Yes or no, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that works for current humans. It does not work so well for, for any non-human animals, certainly anything in the future. Maybe an AI system could, could answer a question, um, you know, and, and provide its its opinion on that. And even just within this, you will generally get different answers depending on how the question is asked and, and how the question is is presented to, to people. Uh, there are so there have been some some controversies over the years in things like the design of uh, ballots for um, electing uh, for for voting and uh, who who to, who to elect into office, um, and more generally, how you ask people questions will affect what sort of answers you get from them. And so there are design issues there in terms of how we would go about measuring what it is that people value. And that's just within the set of using asking people questions as the way of figuring out what they value. Uh, another thing you can do is to observe behavior. Uh, see people out and about doing things around the world. This is used a lot in economics, where uh, if you see somebody uh, behaving so as to, say, purchase this at a store instead of purchase that, you might infer that they value this more than they value that. And when they purchase something, you can infer that they value that the thing that they purchased more than they value the money that they used to purchase it, which is why they decided to do uh, the purchase. This sort of behavioral approach to things is used a lot in uh, economic analysis and things of that sort. That's a different way of inferring what moral subjects value. Uh, behavior is nice because you can observe the behavior of, of non-humans also. If you see you know, a porcupine or a, a woodchuck or a frog or whatever behaving in a certain way, maybe you can infer that they value that over something different, although it's, you know, it can get a little complicated. Um, a third way of doing things is to use brain imaging. Uh, this has been done in some moral psychology research where they'll, they'll put somebody's head into an MRI imaging machine and then ask them different moral questions and see how their brain lights up in the process. And I think they've done that for, for some non-human animals as well to see how non-human animals process uh, moral questions, you have to present it to them in, in different ways, of course, because they don't have human language for the most part. But uh, it, it does give you a different set of access to how they think about things. But the challenge is that depending on how you ask the questions, um, you could end up getting different answers. And it's always going to be easier to uh, pose these questions to people than it is to pose the questions to uh, non-humans, and certainly it's especially difficult to um, to pose questions to or observe the behavior of, of future or anything. They don't exist yet. So these are all challenges in how we measure the, the values and interests of uh, sub moral subjects and objects. And then finally, uh, given the decisions of who to include, who or what to include, and secondly, how to measure their values and interests. Third, we have to take these individual measurements and aggregate them into some uh, uh, overarching uh, value of what the AI system should be done, uh, what the AI system should do. And uh, you know, for comparison, in, uh, in human society and democracies, that we have to aggregate everybody's votes into deciding who won the election. And oftentimes we just count the number of votes and that person wins, but there are other ways of aggregating. So for example, in the 2016 United States presidential election, Hillary Clinton won more votes for more people across the country, but she didn't win the election because the way the United States aggregates votes for our presidential elections 
the winner is determined by the electoral vote, which is based on how many states uh, each candidate ends up winning. And so that's why Donald Trump ended up winning the election and, and becoming president, even though Hillary Clinton had received more votes. And so this really speaks to the issues about how you aggregate uh, individual, in this case, individual values, value judgments about which candidate was the uh, uh, the better candidate for president into the decision of what to actually do. In this case, the what to actually do is who to put uh, in the White House to be the U.S. president uh, for an AI system. It's just whatever the AI system is going to do, it needs to aggregate all of these uh, value judgments or, or interests in order to decide, okay, what's it going to do? And you know this matters because people are going to uh, disagree with each other about values, their interests are going to conflict with each other, so too if you're including non-humans and so on. And when you do include non-humans, there are some uh, fairly challenging issues that are raised. For example, the world population of chickens is larger than the world population of humans. We've got more chickens than we do people around the world. And so if we give each chicken one vote and each person one vote, well, they outnumber us. And so, you know, are we going to be happy with what the, the chickens decide? Well, right now, based on how we treat the chickens, probably they're not very happy with the decisions that we're making because we're essentially giving them zero votes in, in the decisions that are made. Um, how do we balance that sort of thing? And, you know, that's for chickens. What about, you know, do we give one vote to, to every insect? We're massively outnumbered by the insects. Uh, humans would not have much say in anything if we, if we gave every living being one, one vote or, or counted, uh, the interests of, of each living being equally. Uh, there, these are challenging questions. They're, they're not a straightforward answers to how do we do that. And that's just for the the uh, current individuals, for everyone who might potentially exist into the distant future, that is potentially an astronomically large number of individuals. Do we count future individuals, their, their values or their interests uh, equally uh, relative to the present generation? If so, we could be massively outnumbered and is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? You know, these are these are difficult questions that must be addressed when deciding exactly what sort of uh, values to align the AI to. And that's the the ultimate issue here is what is it that we should be aligning the AI to? This is not a a straightforward, cut and dry sort of question. In fact. There are many different things that we could align AI systems to, and it requires careful thought about these um, these ethical uh, ethical issues in order to decide what is it that we should uh, align AI systems to. The standard of idea of oh, just align it to human values, and and then you know just make sure you get the computer code right. That's that's not adequate. That that really doesn't work because, first of all. Even within the space of current humans, you still have the issues of uh, like, how do you measure human values? How do you aggregate it across uh, different people? Uh, and then oh, you, know, you can make a strong argument that it is wrong to exclude uh, uh, non-humans and that it is wrong to exclude future, future anything. Uh, and then also there's the question of you know, are we sure that it's values that we should be aligning to and not interests or something like that, uh, something that is an object of ethics? So for example, if there are people out there who think that torturing the innocent is good, do we really want to align AI to those values? And we see around the world uh, that there are you know, a, lot of, a lot of people doing bad things. You know, wars and violence and so on. Do we want the AI system to be aligned to, to that uh, and just kind of hope for the best? Maybe we do, but you know, maybe, maybe we don't. And so there is a case to be made for considering aligning AI to uh, a more objective conception of ethics or perhaps some combination of the two. And that's something to, to figure out. 
uh, let me, before wrapping up, present one more alignment problem, one more uh, puzzle or challenge. And this one is specifically for uh, subjective ethics, specifically for aligning AI systems to uh, some sort of uh, values held by uh, moral subjects. And it has to be more, more than one moral subject. The issue is what happens when moral subjects value what each other values. So very simple case, you have two individuals and they each value whatever it is that the other individual values. So person A thinks that, you know, just values whatever person B values and vice versa for, for person B. And you can imagine this as pseudocode, you know, you have two humans, it, they value uh, each human has values and, and the value of the first human is defined as being whatever it is that the second human values. The uh, values of the second human is defined as being whatever the first human values. And maybe the, the challenge is to maximize the sum of, of whatever it is that they value. Clearly this doesn't work, right? Because it just, you know, goes in an infinite loop. You get stuck. And if you try to implement this in a computer, computer's not going to be very happy with you. I, I use the word happy metaphorically here. You, you get the idea. This, this doesn't work. And you can generalize from this where you have N humans, uh, each of whom has some value. Uh, and then for, for all N of these humans, their value is defined as, it could be a variety of things, but say it's, it's the sum of the values of all of the humans that, that each each person values the sum of whatever all of the, the people value, and then you maximize uh, the sum of each of their values. This also doesn't work. And this is not some, you know, uh, theoretical abstract consideration. It is common for people to value the things that other people value. You probably do this yourself, to, at least to some extent, like uh, for uh, family members and friends to care about whatever it is that their, their family members and friends care about, or even this, where everyone cares about the values of everyone. In moral philosophy, this would be called preference utilitarianism, in which, so preference utilitarianism is the idea that we should do whatever it is that in aggregate uh, uh, optimizes across everyone's preferences. We should try to maximize the satisfaction of, of everyone's preferences. And you can find out there uh, moral philosophers who think that preference utilitarianism is the right uh, uh, ethical theory. And since there is more than one such moral philosopher, raises a challenge of how they would then collectively make decisions because each of them holds values like what is shown on, on this screen here. Their, their values are defined as the sum of the values of everyone else. And it could be humans. There are also some who would value um, the satisfaction of the preferences of, of non-humans as well, which just makes the problem that much more challenging. So this is a real issue. This isn't some hypothetical, you know, philosophical thought experiment. If you were to actually have an AI, uh, you know, maximize the sum of, of what everyone values, you're going to bump into this. This is going to be something that, that is faced. And in, um, you know, there are ways to resolve it. So for example, if you try to just resolve certain decisions, like who should be the next president of the United States, you can just have everybody pick and, and they use their judgments about, you know, their values and everyone else's values and how that all aggregates together. And they just pick a candidate and then you can go from there. And so with that sort of approach, you don't have to, but if you are trying to more deeply derive the underlying values that an AI system should have so that it could operate across all situations and not just you know one situation like who should be the next president, then this is an issue that depending on how the AI system is designed, you could end up facing. And so uh, yeah, I'll I'll uh, pause there. The again, the the main message here is that the AI alignment problem, it's 
if it's not wrong per se, I mean, what is wrong to, is to just think in in monolithic terms of there being some some singular AI alignment problem that we just need the solution to and everything will be better. Uh, that's not quite right. What is right is to recognize that there is a multitude of AI alignment problems and that uh, we need to think carefully about which alignment problem or problems plural we want AI systems to, uh, uh, which, which forms of alignment we want AI systems to be aligned to. We have to think carefully about that. Otherwise, we could just go run off and have AI systems do the wrong thing, and you know we could end up with with worse results because of that. So uh, that's uh, that's all my talk, and thank you. Be happy to take any uh, any questions. Okay, thank you. And so this will be my uh, second presentation for today. Let me go ahead and get my uh, slides there. I just went over here. Um, so again, my name is Seth Baum, and I am executive director of the Global Catastrophic Risk Institute. We are a nonprofit and nonpartisan think tank that works on a range of different global catastrophic risks, climate change, nuclear weapons, pandemics, uh, and so on. Uh, we do a lot of work on artificial intelligence. In the first talk, I shared some of the work specifically on uh, the ethics of how to design AI systems and um, in this talk, I'll be uh, discussing social dimensions. So kind of to uh, to recap a bit, the uh, one of the main points from uh, the first talk was that there are three components to how to build a good AI system. The first talk was about this uh, this idea that we need some sort of conception of good, some sort of fundamental moral concept for what is good. And that's the, the first step. Second step is we need uh, algorithms, computer code that takes that conception of good and uh, it makes it so that you can translate that into an AI system. And then the third step, uh, which is what we'll talk about right now, is, okay, given that you have the idea, the, the conception of good, you have the, the software concept, how do you get this to be actually built in in actual computer systems? Because there's a sense in which without this, all the rest of it is all for nothing. Like you can study all the ethics you want. You can do all of the, the algorithm development and so on. But if your concepts are not getting implemented into the actual AI systems that get built, then you know what what difference does it make? It doesn't really matter in terms of the outcomes of the AI systems itself. And so this, this third step, this really is the crucial one that decides how the AI systems are going to be. And this holds for all different types of AI systems, but it is especially important when you think about the uh, possibility of very advanced AI systems that could exist sometime in the future because the stakes for how those systems are uh, designed and built become that much higher. And so it's really important that those systems are uh, built with good ideas and, and good algorithms. And so that we need to take those ideas, those algorithms, get them put in a place. And so that's the main theme that we're going to be talking about uh, right now. Uh, I do want to summarize a little bit more from the first talk, though, in particular, this idea that the alignment problem, as, as it's commonly understood, it's if it's not wrong per se, it's certainly also not quite right, because there's not just one alignment problem, there's, there's a multitude of alignment problems, depending on, for example, you know, whose or, or what's values or interests we we would align the AI system to. And so uh, the main takeaway from that is that whoever is designing and building AI systems, they need to make some sort of ethical judgment about 
these uh, different dimensions of alignment, what exactly it is that we're aligning it to, how, how we go about doing that. There's no escaping making those judgments. But suppose you've made those judgments and, and you feel good about it. You, you think uh, you have some confidence about that. You have maybe even have computer code that you do it. How do you get those uh, put into place? So uh, there are uh, two basic points here. First, and this is going to seem very simple, but this is really fundamental. It's important to not lose track of this. First, humans build AI, right? It's not, it's not the porcupines. It's not the frogs. It's us, right? And okay, sure. Increasingly, we're able to use AI tools to help us build the AI, but we also built those AI tools or we built the AI tools that built those AI tools. You get the idea that ultimately it's us building the AI, but it's not all people. Right, like I myself, I'm not personally involved in building AI systems. That's that's not part of my own my own activities. Uh, but then the second point is that humans also influence the humans who build the AI system. So maybe you watching this are somebody who builds the AI system, and maybe you know me sharing these remarks with you will have some influence on what AI systems you build. And likewise, for everybody else who builds AI systems, they're all influenced by one thing or another. And that influence can take a, a variety of different forms as, as we'll get into throughout the talk. But first, I want to proceed by a bit of an analogy to, to help stimulate, simulate our thinking and really see how these social processes uh, can play out. Uh, the analogy does not involve AI. It's an analogy from human history, and it is depicted in uh, this photograph, or not photograph, excuse me. This is not a photograph. This is a painting. This is a painting of the United States Constitutional Convention um, that was in the, the original founding of, of the United States as a country. This painting shows the group of people who got together to write and sign this document. This document being the original United States Constitution, which uh, ultimately was about essentially voting procedure. It had seven articles that documented the procedures for um, the, uh, looks like it's going backwards, there we go. Uh, seven articles for the uh, the legislature, which is Congress, the executive, that's the president, the judiciary, that's the, the, the courts. Uh, the fourth article was the role of uh, the states within the United States. Five is on how to amend the Constitution and the voting procedures that are needed for that. Uh, six is on, okay, so given that you voted for a federal government, what are they allowed to do? And then seven is how do you vote to ratify this document, the, the Constitution? And uh, then if you look at um, Article 5, the amendment process, that then has been used over history to uh, modify the Constitution. Indeed, when they were first starting the, um, uh, developing the Constitution, they had ideas for how they would, in short order, want to amend, amend it. And that became the, um, uh, this document, which has the, the first 10 amendments, which is commonly known as the Bill of Rights. And that shows uh, 10 different sets of rights that were given to uh, individuals within the United States. So the first one is individual freedoms, like freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, things of that sort. Uh, the second one is the right to bear arms, which is uh, remains very controversial at this time because the United States is, is dealing with the a major problem of gun violence. Then uh, the third one is the quartering of soldiers, which was actually really important in the, the 1700s when this this was written. It's not so important today. It's about uh, do you have to let soldiers stay in the house? Do you have to provide them quarter where where you live? Uh, then uh, the fourth is about search and seizure, like a, a police, uh, what police are allowed to do. Uh, then uh, five through seven, really five through eight was about the, the legal process, how trials work, what sorts of punishment, like uh, number eight saying like the, there can't be any cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, and then the last two are about 
certain limits to the the powers that in particular the federal government has and these are very different from the uh the original constitution in particular the original constitution was really all within the the domain of subjective ethics this was about voting procedures about how the uh, federal government and the the state governments would uh, you know, make their decisions about what to do, who to elect, what powers the elected individuals would have, and so on. Uh, it was all about the procedures that they would use, that the country would use to aggregate from um, the the individual views of citizens across the country to uh, the decisions that the the government would take um on on behalf of the country whereas the bill of rights falls within the realm of objective ethics in particular these are rights that are given to individuals that the government cannot violate even if uh it is the the aggregate desire of the country to to violate those these are things that the government's just not allowed to do even if the people who are elected uh to lead the government are, are think that that these violations should be done and so on. Uh, now the caveat is that there is a process to amend the constitution to, to change those rights, uh, and that is rooted in uh, the subjective ethics there. But anyway, the 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 rights themselves fall within the domain of of objective ethics. But I want to emphasize that all of this came from decisions that were made in in that room by that group of people and those decisions that were made in that room by that group of people and, and not just in that room and all the conversations leading up to it and, and so on these are decisions that we are still living with the consequences of today uh, so for example as we discussed in the previous talk the 2016 U.S. election ended up with one person, Hillary Clinton, receiving more votes uh, from people across the country. She won the popular vote. And another candidate, Donald Trump, receiving more electoral votes and thus winning the election. That right there traces to decisions that were made in the founding of the country. Uh, and that's probably not even the, the, the most notable case, uh, and especially a uh, compelling one, I think, is the um, the resolution. Um, this is the, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. I'm pretty sure I'm remembering th this correctly, that it's the 19th Amendment uh, to the U.S. Constitution, which is extending the right of suffrage, the right to vote to women. And as prescribed in the Constitution, that amendment uh, becomes valid when it is ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the states across the United States. And after this was proposed, uh, was proposed by Congress and it went to the states to be ratified, uh, there were a number of states that were already ready to go to, to ratify it. But then there were some other states that were less inclined to ratify it. And it was close to getting to three-fourths, and there was a point in which it just needed one more state, and that state was Tennessee. Pretty sure I'm remembering this correctly also. And the legislature was split. This person, uh, Harry Burns, Harry Burns, Henry Burns, I think it's Harry Burns, uh, he was the deciding vote. And what happened was his mother, shown here, wrote him a letter trying to persuade him to vote in favor of uh, the amendment, and he was persuaded by his mother, and so he voted for it, and ever since then, women in the United States have been allowed to vote. It came down to one person uh, persuaded by one other person, and that's what, what changed it now. Okay, I've had... Had he not decided with the amendment to fail it and women never would have been able to vote, you know, probably eventually we would have gotten there, presumably, especially by now, you, you would like to think. But in that moment, 
uh, that's what it all came down to one person being being persuaded by another person in uh, certain branches of mathematics we talk about sensitive dependence on initial conditions chaos theory things of that sort the uh, the butterfly effect that can happen with these things too that that little decisions that are made in situations like this can ripple out and and have big implications down the line and i think this is especially pronounced when you are looking at the decisions that be, could be made on how to design very powerful ai systems you could imagine that you know some group of people gathering to make the decisions about you know, what ethics to build into an ai system how how to design the ai system of course ai systems are not designed in rooms that look like that they you know look more like this. this is a photo from the the office of deep minds the the ai company circa 2015 um give or take but you know decisions that are made in in spaces like this could have profound impacts uh over over uh decades or centuries even especially for really advanced ai systems especially if it's a system that we then have less opportunity to go back and adjust or if adjusting it uh, later is difficult in the way that amending the united states constitution is a difficult thing to do and indeed there are some ideas that we have right now in the united states about maybe we would like to change the constitution in this way or in that way uh, one of the big ones is actually to change the electoral college so that whoever gets the most votes across the people uh, wins the election, unlike what happened in, in 2016. And it's just, it's hard to amend the Constitution. And so the decisions that were made, they they have this really durable effect. And the same could be true for, the, for uh, decisions that get made about how to design, especially how to design very advanced AI systems. So that leaves the question, how do you get the, the good AI designs implemented? And uh, so what you need is you need an idea of what good AI is. Uh, you need access to the, the people who are doing it and you need to persuade. If you yourself are not one of the people who is designing the AI system, if you are, you know, you just, you use your, your, your capabilities there. But for, for the rest of us, it comes down to some means of persuasion. And the persuasion could be things like you know this this talk that I'm giving right now has has some persuasive capacity, uh, but it can take a lot of other forms. So for example, around the world, uh, governments are developing policies for AI, with um, the European Union, the United States, and China probably being the the most active on that front. Uh, but certainly, other countries are also involved in in developing AI policy. And so how does this matter for what um, is done with AI? Well, in the extreme case, if, if an AI development group is, is not following the law, then the governments have the capacity to show up to those offices where AI systems are being developed and they can you know, show up with you know people carrying large guns and, and say that you guys need to change how you're developing AI systems. And Suffice to say, if it ever came to that, um, this could be rather persuasive to what gets uh, what gets done in the offices of of groups that develop AI systems. Now, I want to be very clear: in most cases, it does not come down to this that uh, uh, compliance with with government laws uh, for things like developing AI systems, usually they don't actually need to show up with people like guns. This is a bit of an extreme example. Uh, it, it generally doesn't come down to this, but this is always there on the table as a, a possibility, as something that governments are able to do to effectively persuade um, AI developers to do this and to not do that and so on, according to whatever laws, um, whatever policies the, the government creates on on ai now i want to go through uh 
in in a bit more detail um excuse me uh, how to influence uh, companies that that develop ai and the reason for focusing on companies is that at this point in time the corporate sector is arguably the main uh, source of ai development they have uh, you know they're developing a lot of the most advanced ai systems there still is a role played by other sectors uh, apart from corporations academia continues to be involved in the, um, the, especially on basic research as academia tends to do, basic research about um, what sorts of, of AI algorithms could be developed and, and uh, issues that get raised and so on. Academia certainly still plays a role. Uh, however, uh, the, the most advanced AI systems, for the most part at this point, are all being developed within uh, corporations. And uh, the reasons for this are pretty obvious. It's worth a lot of money. Um, and indeed, uh, some of the most um, you know, cutting edge AI systems are being developed by some of the largest corporations in the world. And so for that reason, it's important to think about how to uh, get AI companies to develop AI that is, in some sense, good. Whatever, whatever we think to be good, um, a, a good type of AI system, and to make sure that they don't um, don't uh, develop bad types of of AI systems. So, how do you, in practice, how do you actually do that? Because you know, if you are somebody within the company, okay, sure, fine, uh, but it's actually important to to break it down to who is in the company, who's outside of the company, and what can each of us do? Because uh, we all have opportunities to influence what companies do, uh, regardless of whether we are inside or outside of the company. So let's break it down, different roles, nine different roles of people, both inside and outside of corporations, and how they can affect what companies do on AI. Let's start within the companies. And let's start with management. So management would be the people in uh, managerial roles from the corporate executives on down to just kind of the rank and file managers who oversee different teams of, of people who are developing and deploying AI systems. And managers are a good place to start because they are often the ones making the decisions about what AI systems are designed and built. They consider all of the different uh, uh, factors that go into it, and you know they make the call, and then that's uh, for the most part that's what ends up getting implemented. Now, one might think that within a corporation, you know, corporations just exist to to maximize their profits, maximize the return for their shareholders, and so on. That's not strictly true. It's a, a commonly held idea, but the, the fact of the matter is that companies have a lot of opportunity to uh, deviate from what might just you know maximize profit and that's it. Because uh, at the end of the day, companies are made out of people and that you know that starts with management. People who are in a management position can look at the decisions available and, and just make the judgment call. In this case, we're going to not maximize our profits. We're going to do this other thing because we think it's right for the world. And this happens. This happens with um, you know some, some regularity. I can't tell you exactly how often this happens. It's not something we really have data on. Um, but I can give you an example. Um, outside of the, the AI context in, in the realm of the environmental impact of companies. There is uh, a term called greenwashing. Now, greenwashing is when a company will try to get itself good publicity for protecting the environment, even when the company overall is not doing very much to protect the environment. Uh, Maybe the company does this one token project that's good for the environment, and then they do this big PR campaign to, to generate all this publicity surrounding this, this one little thing that they do. And they try and use that, that one little thing to get their attention, uh, get the attention of the world, and 
portray this idea that the company is doing things that's good for the environment when in fact the company is not doing all that much for the environment it's just doing this one little thing and then maybe the rest of it would be bad for the environment just to, to give an example and this is, this is just a, an illustrative example would be like suppose you're you're a big fossil fuel company but you set up a program where in the office place the employees are uh, recycling right they're they're separating their cans and bottles and paper and so on and so you run a big publicity campaign about how your office is recycling right that's great your fossil fuel company that's not the the recycling that you do in the office that's really not the point in terms of your environmental impact that's greenwashing and that is a practice unfortunately fairly common and it's something that is an issue uh in which companies are really more focused on maximizing their profits instead of doing what's good for the world but there's another phenomenon called brownwashing uh the term brownwashing uh, sometimes brownwashing also pertains to uh, uh issues of, of race and diversity but in the environmental context brownwashing is when a company publicizes itself as not doing as much to protect the environment as it actually is they're, they're actually downplaying what they're doing to protect the environment so the company is going out of their way to protect the environment and then in their publicity to the rest of the world they're kind of hiding that it's the opposite of greenwashing it's a really curious phenomenon and there are reasons why companies will sometimes go out of their way to protect the environment and then not really talk about it all that much and it's because their audience actually doesn't like it when the company will go out of their way to protect the environment um, and one reason for this is that uh, when the company is really expected especially by investors to be focused on generating uh, financial returns this environmental work that they're doing could essentially spook the investors persuade the investors that this is not a good profitable company and then they put their investment dollars somewhere else another would be for uh, cultural or political reasons if the company has an audience that actually just for cultural and political reasons doesn't like environmental protection and this happens unfortunately there are some some out there who think that environmental protection is is not really a good thing for for companies to be working on and so for those audiences companies could actually downplay their their environmental impact and the reason this is so important is because it underscores that people within the companies have agency they have the capacity to do things that they think are good for the world even if that's not what's going to maximize the the money for that company and a lot of that decision uh, a lot of those decisions are made by management within the company and so that means uh, for people who are in the position of management within the company uh, there's really a lot that they can do to orient that company toward what they think is good for the world that goes for environmental protection it also goes for uh, developing and building ai systems that uh, managers within companies can make the call to orient the, the design and, and building of ai systems towards uh, what they see as being good for the world even if that may go against what's good for that company so that's the first one management now let's talk about workers now what do we mean by workers first of all <clears throat> okay strictly speaking management they also work you know management that that is a type of work they're they're employed by the company and so on but uh when we say workers here what I mean is people who work at the company but are not in a managerial roles the um, you know people for AI these are the people writing the computer code and developing the AI systems really implementing um, the general direction that might be suggested by management and if you are a worker at an AI company you also have a lot of agency a lot of capacity to set the direction for what the the company does okay a lot of that direction is set by management but 
um, the workers are in conversation with management. They can go when they when they think that management is setting the wrong direction, they can go to management and try to uh, persuade management to shift directions. And they can take some some more uh, uh, more extreme measures in that if they if they feel so inclined. Indeed, we've seen workers protest and in some cases even go on strike. There have been worker protests within the the AI sector, even just within the last few years, where workers are concerned about the the ethics of what uh, of the direction that the company is going in, and so the workers will. Uh, try to push the company in a different direction. They can have some some success with that. That's something that that is that can be very influential, especially with a sector like AI, when talented workers are in such high demand. That demand gives workers a lot of leverage over what the company ends up doing. Okay, next. Uh, we have investors, those who are funding the company. That could be for, for a publicly held company. That could be uh, the people who own stock in the company. For a privately held company, that could be the, the, the private investors, whoever's putting money into it. And investors do not have full control over what goes on inside a company. The management, the workers, they still have a lot that they can do uh, that you know, investors are, in many cases, not even going to know about. But investors can pull their money from the company, and that gives them a lot of influence over what happens within the company. And so uh, it's important for people who are invested in AI companies to uh, encourage or, or even insist that the, the companies and the workers and, and management within the companies develop AI in, in good fashions. So, really that this is a very influential way to affect what goes on in the company. Okay, so that's all for people who are in some sense within the AI company. But what about on the outside of the, the AI company? What can people on the outside do? Start with corporate partners. These are kind of half in, half out, mostly out, but uh, corporate partners would be uh, other corporations or other entities that do business of one sort with the company. So, for example, if you are developing software and that's you're you're an AI company that develops software, who provides the hardware? Some cases the AI company has its own hardware, but in many cases the hardware is provided by some outside company, uh, often uh, you know a cloud computing sort of uh, a computer hardware provider. And so if you are that company providing the computer hardware, for example, uh, then that relationship that you have with the AI company, that gives you an opportunity to have some influence. You can say, look, you know, I'm happy to keep working with you, but I have some concerns about how you have been going about doing the, the AI system development that you've been doing. And so I would like to see you change your practices. And if so, we can keep working. Maybe I'll even give you, cut you a little deal or something if you do it, if you know, uh, the partner wants to really try to influence what the company does. Then uh, another one is industry consortia. These are basically groups of groups. These are groups that will have um, uh, AI companies and other people within that, that or other other entities within that industry uh, get together to try to think things through and make decisions as an industry. Uh, so, for example, within AI, um, entities like IEEE are, are really important, and they can influence things such as by uh, developing standards for AI systems. IEEE is very active in developing standards and uh, you know companies will often follow the the standards or at least be influenced by the standards that are developed by by IEEE and and other India industry consortia the industry consortia can also play a role by just convening dialogue being a, a space where different people and in, in groups within the industry can get together and talk with each other those conversations become another setting in which there can be influence um, of the, the developer, the, the companies developing AI. 
Uh, then moving along, we have nonprofit organizations. Um, my own organization, we are we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, there are different types of nonprofit organizations that can have influence on how AI systems are developed. My own group, we are primarily a research uh, institute, and so we develop I ideas about um, what what it means to design good AI systems and how to go about doing that. And you know, we publish the research, share it through presentations like this and so on. And that's one way to, to have some influence. Uh, other nonprofits might be focused on advocacy um, and, and so on. And these are all things that can have substantial effect on uh, how AI systems are designed by providing ideas to companies about um, how they should try to um, uh, design their AI systems, uh, trying to persuade them that this is the right thing to do, also by applying certain pressure to further motivate the, the AI companies to, to do what they, they see as being the right thing. Uh, and this, this can be very influential. Uh, then next we have the public. And the public, Okay, it's sometimes a bit far removed, but it, it can matter because, especially for companies that are very consumer facing, they need to have the public on their side. If, if the public is not interested in the products that a company develops, then you know, that can really harm the company's business model. And you know, we see this where the public will have a negative reaction to something that a company is doing. And that company will then shift course because they need to stay on the public's good side in order to you know, maintain good relations with the members of the public, uh, really for, for two different roles. One is where the public is a customer or a user of um, the things made by the company, could be using an AI system, you know, which... Which AI systems do we use? Which search engines? Which social media sites? Which, which, um, if if we're using the the new language models, which ones, if any, are we using? Uh, that is uh, one reason for the for companies to try to appeal to the public. Uh, another is the the public votes in you know any country that has a, a democracy, the public votes, and and that shapes public policy because politicians want to follow what um, what the public wants, otherwise politicians might not get reelected. And even countries that are less of democracy, uh, governments are always going to be interested in doing what the, the public wants. And so it is, uh, public really can have a uh, substantial influence on what goes on inside companies. Then we have the media, and journalists and, and so on, who, can play important roles by informing the public, informing policymakers, getting getting information out there, uh, helping to shape narratives and understandings of, of what's going on in the companies. Uh, that can be very influential. And then finally, governments. Uh, as we talked about earlier, you know, governments can pass policies that, in the extreme case, can be enforced with um, you know with the, the use of force with guns and so on. And so these are, uh, but even even without that, um, governments have a lot of different ways to, to influence companies because uh, you know companies know that governments ultimately have a, a certain degree of power um, and that you know, if the, the company wants to, do business within that country or or that that state or or whatever jurisdiction they need to, you know, uh, abide by the the rules of the government. Okay, so those are nine different types of of people, uh, types of position that can influence how corporations design and deploy AI systems. And the bottom line takeaway from all of this is that no matter what your role is within the overall world of AI, even if you're just a member of the public, uh, but uh, certainly if you are in one of these other roles, there are things that you can do to influence what AI systems are designed and, and built. 
This is not something just for the people writing the computer code and so on, uh, though certainly those people also have an important role. And the other point here is that this is all uh, social processes. These are rooted in human interactions. It's not, you know, this is not about computer code per se. This is about how humans influence what humans do to write computer code and, and build AI systems and so on. Let me mention one other dimension to this uh, before wrapping up. And this one is aimed specifically for those who are developing AI systems. And that's uh, uh, the idea of, of self-importance. And this is something that for me really resonates. You know, I have a, a background in engineering and, and when I was in engineering before doing the, the risk work that I do now, uh, one of the motivations was to really try to be someone who is building important technology. And I think a lot of that, a lot of us, no matter what sector we work in, a lot of us have this, this aspiration to, to be someone important. And this is something that comes up a lot with AI, especially when you're looking at the possibility of building really powerful, really advanced AI. The people who are there developing and building the AI systems may be may gravitate toward that because they want to feel important. They they are attracted to the possibility of making a really big impact on the world. And the the problem here is that that attraction can motivate people to try to do something even when it might not be the right thing to do. And this is this is a tension that people can face sometimes where maybe you feel like this thing that you could do is not good for the world, but if you did it, you would be important. You would have a really big impact on the world. And so you feel compelled to do it, even though it might not be the right thing. And something that I encourage everyone is to resist that temptation, that, that feeling of self-importance, to uh, let yourself only do that thing that is uh, only do that thing if you really think that it is good for the world and to be okay with in some sense being less important because being less important then will be better for the world. This is something, uh, a challenge that I think a lot of people face when they are in situations such as having the possibility to uh, build or contribute to the, the building of uh, advanced AI and other technologies and something that uh, I really do hope that, that people can be mindful of. So uh, to wrap up, really the, the basic idea here is that one, humans build AI, two, humans influence the humans who build AI, and I guess three then, we must understand and really take advantage of these social processes in order to achieve AI that is good for the world. And this is really ultimately what it comes down to for how to get good AI systems built is the people building them and the people influencing the people building them must build those systems in a good fashion, use their influence to push people to build AI systems in a good fashion. Let me close with a bit of an idea. Um, and this is something that is especially uh, pertains especially to building advanced AI systems, which is the idea of a constitutional convention for AI. And I don't know if this idea really holds, um, but it's something I think can be a helpful perspective for thinking about how we design AI systems because. In the United States Constitutional Convention shown, shown here, there were uh, delegates from the uh, each of the different states that existed at that time. We have more states now than, than we did at the time. but And they got together 
and they made their decisions about how to design the United States Constitution. And then it all, you know, the the, the country has, has played out since then in, in some good ways, maybe some bad ways. But this idea of a constitutional convention may be a good way of thinking about how we would go about deciding how to design, especially the, the most advanced AI systems, as opposed to it being done just within the, the rooms of whatever mostly private companies are the ones designing them. Perhaps we could have a process that is more representative of those who would be designing the AI systems or excuse me, those not just designing the AI systems, but who would be affected by the AI systems. And you know, ideally it wouldn't be in something like this, it would be more like the, the United Nations General Assembly where the, the countries of the world would in some way get together to uh, decide how to build AI systems. And, and it could maybe have a something analogous to a constitutional convention to set the terms through which a, an AI system would be designed to, to craft what goes into the AI system itself in the same way that uh, a constitutional convention crafts what goes into a constitution. And so I, I want to leave this out there as an idea for, for consideration, something that we can reflect on as perhaps a good approach to um, uh, to deciding how AI systems should be designed. And I'll stop there, be happy to take any questions. Thank you.